Welcome to week 10 of the Sabbath School Commentary, Doing the Unthinkable. If you're joining me in your car or through your phone or your iPad or wherever it is you're tuned in today, it's good to be with you here at Gra- uh, from Grafton. Doing the Unthinkable, this reminded me of a, a story of a, of a father and his son. A single father and his son are united every day in each other's constant presence. Every moment of every day they have been together. The love of the father for his, for his son is great. And throughout their love and their life together, they share perfect relationship of peace and unity. They play in the park together. They are best friends and, and share their humble small meals as if it might be their last. They are in full appreciation of every chance they get to have a beautiful heartwarming moment with each other. Their love is inseparable and it grows deeper and deeper for each day and every day they are alive. One day the father is called to work and as usual the son follows and plays in the nearby creek not far from his dad's eyesight. The father's job is to pull a lever that opens a railway bridge and lets the boats pass through. As the son fishes in the creek, he watches as his father intensely. His father has stepped away from his station and the son hears a boat. He calls out, Dad, Dad, there is a boat coming, but there is no reply. The son then takes it upon himself to climb into the bridge and open it manually. He starts to to wind and the bridge slowly opens. As this happens, the father hears the station phone ring and there is a train coming through that has gone right through a red light. The father looks and sees the bridge opened. The boat is through and his son is nowhere to be seen. He then realises that his son is in the bridge and has opened it manually. He sees the train quickly approaching and knows his son has little time to get out. The bridge has to be closed to let the train through safely, but the son is stuck and has no escape. The train is here and the bridge needs to close. The father has no choice but to pull the lever or he can run and save his son. But that would mean the countless loss of lives for many. But his son would be killed. What does he do? He can't leave his station. He, the father cries out in anger, agony, and he pulls the lever. He races down to his son, but the bridge has to close. And his son is killed. He falls to his knees in despair and watches as a train goes by. He notices through the windows of the train that it is full of the prisoners and he remembers that the death row train was was moving through today for sentencing. The train goes past and he climbs into the bridge and finds his son. He gently picks him up and walks off into the distance. Such a great sacrifice for the life of others who had already been labelled with a death sentence. This truly was doing the unthinkable. You know, when I first read the title for this week's lesson, all I could think of was the unthinkable things that I had done in my life. And let me tell you, there's been plenty of them. But this week we look at doing the unthinkable at the other end of the scale. We look at Jesus. Jesus came to do the most unthinkable act in the most magnificent display of love to reach the unreachable. You and me and all humanity completely lost in a world full of sin. We see this amazing act of love unfolded and told hundreds of years before it even happened. The memory text this week, Isaiah 53 verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. It's beautiful, the translation of the New King James that is used here. By his stripes, we are healed. The word healed is a beautiful word as you look into it a bit further. 
This word means more than just being saved. When you go to the New Testament, the Greek word for saved is sozo, which means to be delivered, to liberate, to make well, to heal, to restore health and to make whole. We are not just saved from sin or from destruction that it brings, but we are completely made whole. We are healed. We are healed in, and God's desire for us is to experience this wholeness, this newness in life, in the here and now, which is the language that Jesus uses when he talks about the abundant life, the abundant life that starts now when you are fully healed and made hold from what sin is trying to take away from you. The lesson this week starts us off in Isaiah 50, and here you begin to see the picture of God's great love that Jesus faced in order for our healing. We are introduced to a new section of Jesus the servant, and this beautiful passage declares his devotion to a task that was before him. He comes as a teacher of men, yet he is instructed by the Father, as the Gospel of John tells us in chapter 8, verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. I love how in Verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 50 now, it says that I know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. We think of that text in Matthew 11 verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened, and I will give you rest. The crazy thing about all of this is before Christ came to this earth, The plan for his life was laid out in front of him in perfect details. But when he came living as a man among men, he laid aside his foreknowledge of all the things and was guided by the Father's will, as was given to him day by day. Ellen White talks about this in The Desire of Ages, page 147. When we think about this, it makes so much more meaningful all those occasions where Jesus spent time, entire nights in prayer. There's a power in prayer. There's a power when when we pray and we can stay connected. Jesus had come into this world as as the living word the spokesman for God, and his mission was to comfort all who were weary of sin. His ears were opened and ever ready to hear the Father's will, even in the most difficult of situations, like in the garden where he swept great drops of blood, dying in agony from the psychological torture of being full of sin. Jesus still cries out, not my will, but yours be done. Isaiah 50 verse 5, it predicts he never turned away. The chapter continues on with so many predictions that were fulfilled. In verse 6, the whipping of Pilate that was ordered by Pilate, the blows that Jesus copped from the Roman soldiers. In verse 7, the setting his face like a flint which was filled, which was fulfilled in Luke 9.51, where Jesus steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem. In verse 8 and 9, screams of the Saviour's innocence, wrongly accused, but trusting in the Father. Then those beautiful words in verse 10. Who walks in darkness? Who has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. After a very rough week in ministry last week, I nearly cried at reading this verse. There are always times of perplexity and darkness, even for those who are set out to hear the voice of God. The enemy is always pressing in to discourage and confuse, 
just like the similar experiences of Job and John the Baptist. But it is a great privilege to all those who find themselves in circumstances in which they must place themselves with full trust in God. In due time, the light that you have been seeking, it will be given to them. As we go into the suffering servant poem of Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, verse 12, it opens up in yet another new section in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold my servant. In this new section, Jesus continues to appear as the suffering servant. Within this section, we see one of the most beautiful presentations of the atoning character of Christ's death. Israel needed more than a military saviour to bring them out of the victory from their enemies. They needed Jesus, and so do we. Jesus, who gives them and gives us victory over sin. And Jesus, the suffering servant, would be successful in his mission. He would humble himself, but God would highly exalt him. And the great men of earth would be blown away by a man so insignificant by human standards who could have such a great influence on men's thinking, on their lives, and in the course of history. This is one of the reasons we should find it an absolute privilege today and an honour to be known as a Christian which flows us straight into who has believed. Isaiah 53, who could believe that someone so exalted as Jesus the Messiah could be so humiliated and suffer so much? As a tender plant, verse 2 says, Christ grew to manhood physically, mentally and spiritually in harmony of the natural laws of human development. As a plant gains its nourishment from the ground, so too was Jesus to draw his wisdom and strength from God. But it calls him a root out of dry ground. You see, to the Jewish leaders, the character of Jesus is found unappealing, just as a plant growing in the dry ground appears stunted and unattractive. Then it says, no beauty, which literally means no appearance. There is nothing to attract attention. Men were not to be attracted to Jesus by the display of supernatural glory, but by the beauty of a righteous life. Ellen White tells us in Desire of Ages more of this on page 23, 27 and 43. Jesus walked among men as a perfect man, Isaiah does not refer to Christ's personal appearance as a man, but only to the fact that he was not the kind of Messiah the Jews were interested in. Despised and rejected in verse 3. Throughout his life, he knew what it was like to be hated and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. When Jesus took on the form of man, he became sensitive to all pain, sorrow and disappointment that is known by man today. We hide as if our faces were from him, it says now. Instead of sympathising with Jesus, his pain and his suffering, men turn from him with bitterness and contempt. We took no pity but approached him as ungrateful people. Even his disciples had left him and fled. Going into verse 4, surely he has bore our griefs. Now in verse 4 to 6, it emphasises the very nature of Christ's sufferings and death. And the Lord then finishes, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is such a sobering thought. Imagine right now, imagine if you could push a button. If there was a button that you could push and everything you had ever done wrong was brought to your full attention. No buffer, no sense of forgiveness, 
what would happen? You would psychologically explode. And yet this is what Jesus went through. Only it wasn't just one person's wrong, but the sin and iniquity of everyone that had ever lived and everyone that will ever live. And this is even before any of the physical torture started. Isaiah is honing in now on this unthinkable truth that Christ chose to suffer to reach the unreachable, his very own. You and me. Jesus then hung on the cross while they yelled, if he is the son of God, let him save himself. Here's the irony. He could have. And yet the great love, the unfailing love of God, the love that he has for you and for me, it kept him there. Jesus would have rather ceased to exist for all eternity than to live in eternity without us. The fact that it was for us and not for himself and that he suffered and died is repeated nine times in these verses. And then again in 8 to 11, he suffered instead of us. The pain and humiliation that we deserved the abuse that we should have received. He took it on himself. Jesus was the perfect transforming reparation offering. The Hebrew word here is asham, which is usually translated as trespass offering. This offering is presented under the circumstances in which restoration is required. The death of God's servant provided an acceptable and effective atonement for sin, which was responsible for loss. This sacrifice was totally essential to man's restoration and redemption. John the Baptist sums this up perfectly in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, when he cries out, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. You know, it's crazy. In society today, as crazy as it is, you're doing the unthinkable when you choose to follow Jesus. People will say, why on earth would you do that? But how? How can you look at the reality of what we've just seen? And say no to Jesus. Today, will you behold the Lamb of God? Will you be set free from sin? Will you choose Jesus? Will you be healed and made completely whole? Eternity, brothers and sisters, it starts today. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the perfect gift of Jesus. We want to thank you that he came to this world at just the right time to pay the price for our sins. Father, forgive us as a people. Forgive us for constantly falling short of your glory. Wash us white as snow. Father, help us to to no longer live in fear of death, but to know that we have been set free. Father, we can't thank you enough for the ultimate gift that you gave. And Father, we look forward to an eternity of learning the science and song of your salvation. Father, we thank you today for Jesus. And we just pray that you will help us to behold him in every step of the walk in our lives to come. Father, we thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.